In his book, The Way of Wisdom, Timothy Keller briefly summarizes both the book of Psalms and Proverbs. And he says this, Psalms is about how to throw ourselves fully upon God in faith. Proverbs is about how, having trusted God, we should then live that faith out. If the Bible were a medicine cabinet, Psalms would be the ointment put on inflamed skin to calm and heal it. Proverbs would be more like smelling salts to startle you into alertness. So as we go to God's Word today, that's what I'm asking, that He would startle us to alertness, alert to who He is, alert to what He is doing in our midst, and alert to the great privilege of being His children and being able to come to Him in prayer, seeking Him for wisdom. So let's do that now. Let's pray once more. God, it's such a privilege to know you and to have access to your word and to come to it, Lord, and learn from it. And God, as your word says, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. So, Father, teach us and give us understanding today, and we know that this comes from you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. So as it's been stated, we've been in the book of Proverbs uh, for our our preach series. And over the past several weeks, we've learned uh, about a few different aspects of wisdom. First, the beginning of wisdom, understanding what it is, understanding the call of wisdom, the value and the blessing of wisdom. And then both last week, uh, as Jez shared with us, and then this week, Uh, we want to look at two means of growing uh, in wisdom. So both Jez and Terry, they've brilliantly unpacked these truths. uh, And as we've sought to look at the scriptures and learn what it means to be wise, um, I was looking over my my notes uh, just over some of these things, and, and one thing stuck out to me. Well, many things stuck out to me, but this was one that I wrote down. Rejecting wisdom's call will wreck your life. I don't want that for my life, uh, and I surely don't want that for your life. I desire for the wisdom of God to reach into all of our lives and to change us from the inside out. In order to make space for wisdom, as, as we're calling our series, we need to be committed to the means in which we will grow in that wisdom. We've been learning that true wisdom comes from God Himself, And the key to growing in wisdom, then, is to go straight to the source of wisdom. And we do that primarily through two ways, two means of growth. Going to the Word of God, learning it, uh, and then praying to God. So last week, Jez unpacked what it would look like to grow in the wisdom of God's Word, and he suggested uh, a few things. He said, we should love the Word, learn the Word, and live out the Word. And in order for us to do this, we have to trust the author of those words. And that's what our passage implores us to do today when it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. So my goal today is to faithfully help us learn together what it would look like to grow in wisdom through prayer specifically as we look at this passage in Proverbs 3 and the wise guidance that God gives us with these verses. So as you'll see here on on the slide, there's three things that I think as we look at prayer in light of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, three things that we're being invited to do. Let us lean in prayer to the Father. Let us listen in prayer to the Spirit. And let us look in prayer to the Son. So in order to make space for wisdom in our lives, we need to make space for prayer. So number one, lean in prayer to the Father. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Where is your deepest trust today? Have you given your heart fully without reservation to your good and merciful Heavenly Father? Have you trusted Him like this and have you received this grace and mercy in the gospel that allows us to go to God and call Him our own Father, just as Jesus Himself instructs us when He teaches His disciples how to pray, when He says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. 
But even for those of us who have turned to, to God in faith, who have trusted Him as our Father, we still struggle with trust. We, we struggle with trusting Him fully like we ought, trusting Him with all of our heart. As the Proverbs has, has shown us already, it's the wisest thing we could do with our lives, the wisest place we can put our trust. Perhaps we're, we're relying too heavily in, in trusting ourselves. I feel like that's the default of the human heart, to trust ourselves. What area of your life do you need to surrender to trust in the Lord? You see, it's one thing to believe that God exists, to just simply uh, you know, believe that He is out there somewhere, but it's a whole other element to trust Him with our whole being. I don't know if you've uh, had the time to see the, the floor, the space that we're on, but in each four corners, there's a floor-to-ceiling window. Uh, and I had this picture in my mind when I was thinking about trust because I see those windows and they make me nervous, especially when our children are running around. Uh, but th- th- this is my point, is that um, you know, it's one thing to look at that glass and see it from floor to ceiling and say, I, I believe that that glass exists, but looking at that in, in, um, in comparison to actually leaning against the glass and trusting that it'll support us as we look down at Broad Street and trust that we're not going to fall uh, down to Broad Street. Um, you don't look and trust, or sorry, you don't actually trust the glass if the closest thing that you're willing to do is to just slide your chair up to it and look out without leaning against it. You see, the same issue is taking place in our hearts if we're just sitting in a comfortable chair of faith rather than leaning our whole life against God in His wise plan for our life. We have functional idols that are taking root in our hearts that become what we trust, and we lean on those things rather than God Himself. So which idols compete with trust in your heart? Let me give you an example of three, and I want to look at another passage here in Jeremiah 9. And it speaks to three areas um, that, that, are, that can be rivals to our trust. It says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So the three that are focused in there, are, are we tempted to boast in our own intellect? We know that wisdom isn't just intellect and knowledge, but uh, are we trusting in our own uh, strength, our own might, or are we trusting in our own resources. You see, we shouldn't boast in our own devices. As this passage says, if we're going to boast, boast because you understand and have the privilege of knowing the Lord, the one who wants to give you wisdom and understanding. A little bit later in Proverbs chapter 21, we may get there eventually. Uh, I can't remember exactly uh, which chapters we'll cover, but Uh, In Proverbs 21, it says, No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. You see, God's wisdom is superior. And if this is true, then it is insane to lean on our own understanding, as Proverbs 3.5 says. Author John Bloom affirms this, this this idea of the insanity of leaning on our own understanding. And he writes this. You can follow along with this quote. So many of the things that cause us the most difficulty and heartache in life, the source of so much of our anxiety, fear, doubt, and anger with others and with God, is the result of leaning on our own understanding. God does not want us to be miserable even in this fallen, futility-infected evil age. He wants to relieve our anxiety, fear, doubt, and sinful anger. And so He gives us Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as a priceless gift. In exercising faith, trusting fully in the Lord and not leaning on our own understanding, we're not setting aside our intellect. We're resting our intellect upon the intellect of God. Nothing is wiser 
or more sane. To do so is to allow Him to direct our paths, which not only lead to ultimate, to ultimate joy, but also make the journey itself, even when laden with sorrow, joyful. And it preserves for us all the pleasures of God, all the pleasures God provides for us in this world. To not do this is the height of foolishness and the path to misery. Perhaps you're struggling to know if you're leaning on your own understanding too much. Maybe that's hard to really uh, comprehend you know, in your own life. Here's a simple diagnostic. Are you prayerful? Prayerlessness is a symptom of self-leaning, not God-leaning. So how can you put the wisdom of Proverbs 3.5 into practice? Pray. Pray to your heavenly Father and lean on Him. Here's a quick tool I want to share with you. Uh, it's called the ACTS Prayer Model. It's an acronym. Uh, it's a helpful acronym that aids us in being very specific in our prayers and requests to God. And you can see it there, A-C-T-S. A stands for adoration, just praising and worshiping God, leaning in in the worship of God. But then also uh, confessing, going to God and acknowledging the areas where we've leaned too much on our own trust and all the other areas where we've struggled in rebellion and sin. And then thirdly, thanksgiving and gratitude. That can fuel our prayer life because we remember the One who has given us everything. We thank Him and know that He's the all-knowing and all-wise and can direct and guide our lives much better than we can our own. And then lastly, uh, and this is really, I think, at the root of prayer, is just talking to our Father, asking Him, going um, going to Him for anything, and asking Him anything. The Bible makes it very clear in James, when James says that if we don't have wisdom, we can go to God and ask for it. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. And then I I love seeing this in uh, the letters with the Apostle Paul. He writes, he opens up to the churches and he's telling them how he's been encouraged by them and how he's been praying for them. And guess what he prays for and asks for? In Ephesians 1, 16 and 17, he says, to the church at Ephesus, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. And then later in Colossians, he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So, my dear friends, it's the way of wisdom to lean on our Father in prayer. I'm going to close each of uh, these three points with um, with a prayer from or a prayer of wisdom from that book that I previously mentioned, the Way of Wisdom. So, this one says, "Lord, when the Israelites prayed to you for help, you did not respond, but when they put away their idols, you began work in their lives." I too have run to you with my requests without the willingness to root out my deep false gods. O Lord, help me find my all in Thee and in nothing else. Amen. So secondly, we have to listen in prayer to the Spirit. In all your ways acknowledge Him, the first part of verse 6 says. And some other translations that I think are just helpful, it says in the NIV, in all your ways submit to Him. In the New Living Translation, seek His will in all you do. But how? How can we acknowledge Him in everything? How can we submit to Him in different areas of our lives and seek Him in absolutely everything? In order to acknowledge Him, first we have to be aware that He is even there. We we all know that even when we're aware of someone's presence in the room, that doesn't mean that we're choosing to acknowledge them. Even when we do acknowledge them, we then have to make an active decision to then listen to them. Perhaps you've had a parent or your spouse or a housemate or a friend enter a room and they seek to get your attention by speaking to you. But because you haven't acknowledged them, you sure aren't listening to them. I'm guilty of that. I'm sure we've all struggled with it at times, but we do it with God all the time. We know He's there, 
We know He's present, but are we listening? Perhaps we can listen to Him better if we first acknowledge His voice above all the rest. So where is your attention? Whose voice is loudest in your life? Which voices are you acknowledging above the voice of God? Here's a wise secret. Prayer tunes our ear to the voice that rises above all the rest. God gives His Holy Spirit of truth to us to guide us into all truth, the Scriptures say, and to empower the life of the believer. And so when we lean in and acknowledge our Father in prayer, we can guarantee that He will help us listen to what He is speaking to us. This is just a helpful uh, story. Katie and I were were chatting about this, and she told me that back in the autumn term, uh, I guess some of the families were a part of this uh, at Second City, but it was some families across the city uh, part of a homeschool co-op, and they did this. Um, they did this fun activity where uh, they blindfolded the kids, and uh, the moms would call out to their child. I guess they kind of mixed them up and were spread out across the room. And as the mom would cry out, uh, it took a, f- a few minutes to get through the hustle and bustle, but uh, the child easily walked to their own mother because you know the voice of the one you belong to. Minus my own daughter, I think she ripped the blindfold off and just ran crazy. But uh, point being, you know the voice of the one you belong to. And that's uh, very clear in John chapter 10. So I want to read to us uh, a few quotes from Jesus himself. These are glorious truths. Of um, He's talking about uh, himself as the good shepherd, and he's talking about his sheep who belong to him. And uh, this is what he says. In John 10, 3 through 5, he says, To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And then, Uh, Just a few verses later, in in verse 16, he says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. And then lastly, verse 27 and 28, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. It's a glorious picture of the good shepherd, Jesus himself, crying out to his sheep and them hearing his voice, knowing his voice. But what if we don't currently belong to him? What if we aren't, uh, or what, what if we're the lost sheep that he's speaking of that are far off in the field with no shepherd to hear our cry? Proverbs 15, 29, which we read earlier, it speaks to this. It says, the Lord is far from the wicked but he hears the prayer of the righteous. But you see, this was, this was all of us at one point in time, myself included. I remember when I was far from God and not seeking Him, not listening to Him, wicked and far from Him, living in rebellion. But here's the glorious reality. Though God doesn't hear those in rebellion, He hears the prayers of the righteous, the cries of the sheep who He tenderly cares for. The good news is this, that we don't make ourselves have a righteous enough voice to be heard because it's not about being good enough, but rather trusting and leaning on Jesus who was good enough. He's given you a new voice and a new heart, and you can now be heard because the Good Shepherd has drawn you in as His own, and we can now listen to His voice. Proverbs 1 uh, spoke to this. We, We looked at this a few weeks ago. The necessity of listening when Lady Wisdom cries out in the street. She says, If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you, and I will make my words known to you. God Himself is asking you to listen to Him, to heed His wisdom and warnings, and to trust Him with your whole entire heart, to lean not on yourself, to not acknowledge. Uh, your own ways, but to acknowledge His ways and to come and listen to Him. 
And if you don't do this, Lady Wisdom speaks later in, in chapter 1, verse 25 and 28. She says, I've called and you refused to listen. I've stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. You've ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. And then they, she says, they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. God has spoken. He's calling and we need to listen because it's not until we do that he will listen in return. We all too often fear the voices of the rest of the world and we fail to listen and respond to the voice that truly matters. And this is unwise. If, if you feel it bubbling up in your heart of this longing to want to start fearing God and honoring Him and listening to Him, I invite you to pray this prayer with King David in Psalm 86.11. He just simply says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. That is a wise prayer. And when this is your heart posture towards God, then you're able to listen to Him, you're able to acknowledge Him in all your ways, and submit to His will for your life. So our prayer from the way of wisdom for listening is this, Lord, I want to make you my fear, rather than be both intimidated and enticed by things in this world that can't hold a candle to your power and glory. Make yourself a living, bright reality to my heart. Amen. And then lastly, in point number three, we're going to look in prayer to the Son. In the second part of verse six, and He will make straight your paths. So how straight is your path today? Do you feel confident in the path of life that you're currently traveling on? Is there a specific big decision in your immediate future that you're trying to sort out? Or perhaps you're just trying to grow and making godly decisions on a day-to-day basis. The truth is this, we're all on a path. But how is that path taking shape? According to what Proverbs teaches, there's only two types of paths. There's the wise path and the foolish path, a straight one and a crooked one. And your path is dependent upon who you are looking to. We've been looking at Proverbs, and you have Proverbs, and then before that, Psalms, and before that, Job. And all of these are considered wisdom literature. And um, back in Job chapter 8, one of Job's friends, the poor guys, they're trying to give him advice. And some of it is true, but sometimes they come across a little bit uh, harsh. Uh, But it's truth, nonetheless. And this is what Job said, or Job's friend said, Bildad, he said in uh, verse 8, chapter sorry, chapter 8, Such are the paths of all who forget God. The hope of the godless shall perish. His confidence is severed, and his trust is a spider's web. He leans against his house, but it does not stand. He lays hold of it, but it does not endure. The path of those who forget God is hopeless, and it has a grim ending in sight. But the most frustrating thing in the midst of walking this path is rather than a street, straight, clear path, you have a spider's web of decisions and directions. And exacerbated by the circumstances, the fool goes to lean on what he thinks is a solid shelter, but it does not stand. Where is the peace in that path of life? Isaiah 59 says, The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths, and they have made their roads crooked, No one who treads on them knows peace. There is none. There's no peace, but there is still hope. There's a better word from the path of wisdom. Listen to the better alternative. Just a little bit later in in our, our chapter from today, Proverbs 3, it says, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding, for the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. And then it says, Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. And just to draw this out a little bit more, some other places I saw in the Psalms. Psalm 17, My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. And then Psalm 25, Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. 
So how does all of this talk about wise paths and foolish paths bring us back to prayer? It's simple. With prayer, we get the blessing of God's direction for our lives. Without it, we're left blindly forging our way through the spider web wilderness. So when you lift up your eyes to the hills and you see the path of life ahead of you, you see that path of life. There's only one who can make your paths straight, and He is the one who your help will come from. So let us look in prayer to the Son, to Jesus Himself, the Son of God. Jesus Christ has gone before us and walked the straight path, and He makes prayer possible because of the straightness of His own path. And we can come in prayer confidently because of truths like Hebrews 10, when it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. So what it's saying there, what the author is saying is that we can enter the holy place of prayer because Jesus has made a way by His own path. Let me give you a snapshot of the straightness of Jesus' path. At the very beginning of His ministry here on earth, we read the following. Matthew shares this with us from John the Baptist. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. His paths in life were indeed straight. That's the glory of the life of Christ, that He came to this world to fulfill a narrow, laser-beam-focused mission, to walk in perfect obedience to the Father and be the Savior of the world. And nothing was going to stop Him or slow Him down on that path, not even death itself. Isaiah prophesied this, and Luke later confirms it in the Gospels, that the straight-path focus of the suffering servant was evident. Isaiah 50 says, But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. And then Luke said, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. That word there that's used in Isaiah, flint, it's a dark and a very hard rock. and It was used as a metaphor in the Bible and in various places, but part of what it's expressing is the hardness of a task. Set my face like a flint was the prophet's figure of speech chosen to express that the Messiah would not waver in the straight path to the cross to die for the sins of humanity, the sins of me and you. The life of Jesus testifies to us wisdom and prayer perfected on the straight path of obedience to God. Jesus, as Paul would say, is the power of God And the wisdom of God. And in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It was in this life of wisdom, in the life of Christ, that he would spend each day in prayerful dependence on his Father. Jesus trusted in God with all his heart. He didn't lean on worldly understanding. And in his darkest hour of prayer, he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. He set his face in obedience and walked the straight path to the cross. Though the world sees the cross as folly, the truth is that the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God wants to make your paths straight. That's made possible only by Jesus walking the straight path on your behalf. God saves you by His wisdom. He then guides you with His wisdom, so now you can pray to Him in wisdom. So lean on Him, listen to Him, and look to Him in prayer. So let me close with our last prayer from the way of wisdom. Lord, I've set my heart on wisdom, but I confess that my spiritual resolve in the past has often flagged. My will is weak. So to help me seek wisdom, capture my heart with a vivid view of Jesus setting His face to go up to Jerusalem to die for me. And it's in Jesus' powerful, beautiful name we pray. Amen.